In this video, I'll be creating a mesh that represents the player from my game in Blender, creating a pawn for the Sun Unreal using C++ and Blueprints, and then creating a player controller that uses the Enhanced Input plugin. Once it's all put together, we'll have a pawn that can fly around the world. I'll be building off the Flybot project that I've created in previous videos. There's a link for these down below, as well as a link to the project files on GitHub. So first, for the player mesh in Blender, I decided to go with a static mesh instead of a skeletal mesh to keep it simple. I will be creating a separate static mesh for the head though, that we can rotate it around in Unreal. This, along with some other small movements, will give it a little bit of life, even if we're not using skeletal animation. For the main body of the mesh, I started with the default cube, and then extruded and added faces and moved points around until I was happy with a basic shape that looks kind of like a spaceship or airplane. I then pulled the cylinder out of the top so a separate head mesh can attach, and then added some detail to the rear engines. I then created a small opening in the front to make it kind of look like a mouth, as well as where the weapon will fire out of. I also created some detail on the bottom. Next, I selected all the outer edges and created a bevel on them to round things out. I then double checked to make sure there weren't any weird spots. I then added some detail to the cylinder that will attach to the head, and also added some vents on the back above the engines. For all the large surfaces around the body, I selected those, inset them a little bit, and then ran a couple extrusions to create these panel pieces. I then beveled each side of these panels. These parts will have some color materials where the rest of the mesh is going to look like metal. I then created three material slots for the mesh. One for the metal frame, one for the colored panels, and one for an emissive material that will come out of the engine's mouth and vents. I then applied the shiny material so I could check for any reflection or shading issues. Overall it looked pretty good. For the head, I started by adding a new default cube. Oh, and then I finally remembered to save it before I lost what I created so far. Then I added a loop cut to the head, dragged it down a bit and scaled the back of the head, and then cut out some angry looking eyes. I then beveled the entire thing to smooth it out. I made a few tweaks to the body where it attaches to the head so there wasn't as much space there, and also set the center of the head so it pivots directly on top of the cylinder coming up. I then created two material slots for the head, one for the main part of the head, and then one for the eyes. It's a pretty simple setup, but I think it'll work well for the game. Also, I'm still kind of new to Blender, and to be honest I've modeled this over a dozen times, so this is probably the best I can do with my current skills. I then UV unwrapped the body and the head and exported it as an FBX file. Now to jump over to Unreal. I opened up my project in Visual Studio and hit Ctrl F5 to open up the editor. I then created a new player folder in the content browser and then imported the player FBX file. I made sure to set it to not create any new materials. Now with the static meshes imported, I open them in the static mesh editor and set up the default materials. Here I use the metal for the frame, the blue PBR material for the panels, and then the blue emissive color for everything else. I did the same thing for the head static mesh, using metal for most of it and the blue emissive material for the eyes. To connect these two meshes together in Unreal, we need to add them as two static mesh components to a single actor. But we're not going to use any actor, we're going to use a special kind of actor called a pawn. A pawn is a special kind of actor because it can be controlled by a player or an AI. To create a new pawn, I'm going to create a new C++ class using the engine's provided pawn class as the parent class. I'm going to name it Flybot Player Pawn. In the future I might have other pawn types, but this is going to be the one used for the player. Once it's done compiling, I'm going to close the editor and go back to Visual Studio. And it'll prompt you to reload the project due to the new files. We now have Flybot Player Pawn.h and .cpp to add our custom code to. For the header file, we'll remove some functions and add a bunch of new properties. We'll keep the constructor and setup player input component function. We'll use this one later on when we add player input. We'll then add a sphere component property. This is going to be used as the root of all other components, so when it moves, everything else moves with it. It's also going to be used to detect collisions with other objects in the world. We'll then have a static mesh for the body attached to the sphere, and then the head static mesh attached to the body. We also want this pawn to provide a view into the world while a player is attached to it, so we're going to add a spring arm component and a camera component. In the flybot player pawn.cpp file, we'll remove the unused functions, and then update the constructor to create all the new properties we just added. We'll leave the setup player input component alone for now. We'll then hit Ctrl F5 to compile it and start up the editor. Now, we could have set up values for all those new properties in our C++ code, but it's generally considered bad practice to hard code things like static mesh names inside of your C++ files. Instead, we're going to create a new player blueprint class, and we'll use the flybot player pawn as our parent class. I find this split between C++ and blueprints for your class is the perfect balance. You can use C++ for the logic, and then blueprints for all the visual elements. In the blueprint editor, you can see the tree of components that we added. The sphere is at the root, with the body and head attached to it, and then also the spring arm and camera attached to the root. We can click on each component and set properties for them. For example, I'll set up the meshes for the body and the head. I'm also going to increase the radius for the sphere. We now have the basics for our pawn ready to go. 
If we hit play, we're not going to see our pawn yet though. This is because our game is set up to use the default pawn class provided from the engine. To change this, we need to edit our game mode. We added a custom game mode in C++ in a previous video, and we could set it there, but again we'd be hard coding a reference to a content asset. Instead, we're going to create a new blueprint class, and this time use our custom game mode as the parent class. In the blueprint editor, you can see all the properties we can change for the game mode. One of these is the default pawn class. We'll update this to use our player pawn blueprint. We then need to go into project settings and tell it to use this new game mode class as our default game mode. Now when we hit play, our project will use our new game mode, which will use our new pawn class, which will show our new player meshes that we created. You can see this in the world outliner on the right as the game's running. You'll see the player pawn BP and the game mode BP. The next thing to do is to set up the input system so we can move the pawn around with our mouse and keyboard. Before adding input, let's talk about players. In Unreal, the engine creates a uPlayer object for every player in the game. There are two types of players. There's a local player, which is a player sitting in front of the game with some type of input, like a controller or keyboard or mouse. There's also a net connection, which is a remote player in multiplayer games. We'll cover this in a later video, but for now let's just focus on the local player. Now, a player object is not an actor, and it's not part of the level that's loaded. It's an object in the engine that's passed between levels. To represent a player in the level, you need a player controller. A player controller is an actor that's in the level, and is the interface between the U player and all the pawns and other actors it wants to interact with. So to handle input, we want to do this in the player controller, and then pass the actions along to whatever pawn we happen to be controlling at the time. We'll create a new C++ class, and use the player controller as the parent class. We'll name it Flybot Player Controller. Once it compiles, we'll close the editor and open up the new files in Visual Studio. Now, there are two input systems in Unreal. The older one, which is the standard input system, and a new one called the enhanced input system. While it's listed as a new feature for Unreal Engine 5, it's actually been in the engine since Unreal 4.26. I'm going to go with the enhanced input system since it's newer and also has some more features. The documentation shows how to do this with content assets in the editor, but I'm going to do it in C++. I find the C++ a bit more concise, and also down the road I want to add the ability to rebind your input keys while the game is running, and I think this will be easier to do in C++. Let's open up flybotplayercontroller.h and add some new properties and methods. We'll first override setup input component from the parent class. This is where we'll set up the mapping from input devices like controllers or mouse and keyboard to actions that we can handle in the game. We'll also add a mapping context that we'll use for the pawn. This is where we'll define all the actions that'll be specific to the pawns we're controlling. For now we'll start with just a move action, which we've also defined. Let's now open up flybotplayercontroller.cpp and define the setup input component function we're overriding. We'll first call the parent method in case it needs to do anything. And then we'll create our pawn mapping context object. We'll then create our move action object and then set the type of value it can contain. An input action can be one of four types a bool, a single float, a pair of floats, and then three floats. We're going to use access 3D, or three floats, because we want to handle X, Y, and Z input. We'll then add this action to our pawn mapping context, and bind it to the W key. Now, anytime the W key is pressed on the keyboard, the number one will be passed into the move action. Other inputs like mice or joysticks on a controller can give values other than one, but keys on a keyboard always give the value of one. Now, you might be wondering why I'm not checking the return value of new object. Originally I did, but then I dug into what new object does. It has a check assertion to make sure it's not null, and it also assumes it's not null because it's dereferencing it in a number of places. So I'm not going to bother checking it. And to be honest, it might be better that you just crash with a null pointer to your reference because it's going to be hard to recover if we can't create our input system. If we try to compile this, we'll get an error because it can't find the U input type set that we're using. This is because the compiler can't find the enhanced input header files. To fix this, we'll open up the flybot build.cs file and add enhanced input as a dependency module. We'll also include the public directory within the enhanced input directory to the include paths. Now when we compile it, it works fine. Even though it compiles, Visual Studio still show these little red squiggles underneath. It's because it can't find the header files to resolve these types. I couldn't quite find the obvious place to add these, so instead I just disabled the red squiggles. I've noticed them pop up in other places as well, just because it doesn't know where all the headers are. Next, let's update our pawn so it starts using the new input mapping we've created in our player controller. In flybotplayerpawn.h, we'll first add a move method that'll handle the move input action. Next, we'll add a floating pawn movement component. This will help smooth movement actions out, rather than just moving the pawn to the new location. 
It does this by applying the input as a force to accelerate the pawn, rather than just moving at a fixed amount. We'll also add a move scale variable, which can change the sensitivity of the move input. Under flybot player pawn.cpp, we'll first need to add some new header files. We'll start by including our new player controller header. Next, we need to include a couple enhanced input headers so we can bind movement to our pawn. We'll also need to include the header for the floating pawn movement component. In the constructor, we'll allocate the movement component and also set a default value for the move scale. Next, we'll bind our input handling in our setup player input component function that we have from earlier. After calling the method on the parent class, we'll cast our player input component variable to an enhanced input component. This will only work if enhanced input is enabled on the project, which we'll do later on. We'll also cast our controller to our flybot player controller class we just created. We'll then check to make sure both of these are not null, just to safeguard against any bugs that could be created in the future. Next, we'll bind the move action that we created in our player controller to our pawn's enhanced input component. Anytime this action is triggered, we'll call the move function that we declared earlier. Next, we'll get a reference to our local player from our player controller, and then use this to get a reference to our enhanced input subsystem. Subsystems are a way to extend some of the core engine classes without having to override them through inheritance. In this case, the enhanced input plugin has created a subsystem attached to the local player. With this subsystem, we can finally add the mapping for our pawn mapping context that we created in our player controller. This is what binds the input keys from the player to our input actions. Last, we'll define the move function that we declared earlier, so it can handle the move action that we bound above. We'll grab the input as a vector from the move action value, rotate this based on where the pawn's currently looking, and then add this as movement input. The floating pawn movement component that we created will consume this input, and then move the pawn as needed. If we try to build and run it, we'll see this error pop up. This is because we haven't included the plugin in our project yet. We included the plugin so it could build in our build.cs file, but not in the project file so it loads when the engine runs. To fix this, we'll load the flybot.uproject file and add a new plugin section. We'll add enhanced input as one of the items and set enabled to true. Now when we try to run it, the editor starts up. We're not quite ready to hit play though yet. We need to open our game mode blueprint and set the player controller class to our new flybot player controller. We also need to open project settings, go to the input section, and then under default classes, set these to the enhanced input versions. Now when we hit play and press the W key, we'll see our pawn move forward. This might seem like a lot of work just to make it move in one direction, but now we can build off the setup to easily add more commands. For example, if we close the editor and open up flybotplayercontroller.cpp, we'll map a new key to it. We'll call map key on the pawn mapping context to map the S key to the move action, just like before with the W key, but this time we'll save a reference to the mapping that was created. We'll then create a negate modifier object and add this to the S key mapping that was just created. Modifiers let you do a variety of things to the raw input that's received, but in this case, we're just going to negate the value. This means that when S is pressed, instead of producing the number one, it'll produce negative one. We also need to include the header file for the input modifiers. If we build it, run it, and hit play, we can see that we can now move forward and backward with W and S. Now let's map some keys for left, right, up, and down. To do this, let's first add a helper function to map our keys. As we add more modifiers, this will help keep things clean. We'll map a key and an action to an input context just like before. We'll then grab a pointer to the outer U object for the mapping context, so we can pass this into new object for the input modifiers. Next, if we passed in true for negate, we'll create and add a negate modifier. Last, if we pass in true for swizzle, we'll create and add a swizzle modifier. Swizzle lets you change which position values are stored in for multi-value input actions. For example, our move action has three values, but we've only been writing to the x value. For other keys, we'll want to write to the y and z values. You do this by specifying an input axis swizzle type, which has these possible values. If we go down to the setup input component function, we can now update our map key calls for w and s. We'll also add key mappings for a, d, spacebar, and left shift. By passing in true for swizzle for the a and d keys, we'll have the input value that would normally go to x instead go to the y position. We'll do the same for spacebar and left shift, instead of going into x, go into the z position. If we build it, run it, and hit play, we can now move around in all directions. This is working well, but now it would be nice to be able to look in different directions. To do this, open up flybotplayercontroller.h and add a new input action called rotate action. In flybotplayercontroller.cpp, we'll create the rotate action object, set it to be three dimensions, and then map our mouse input to the new action. In this case, the three dimensions won't be x, y, and z. Instead, I'll use pitch, yaw, and roll, just like the F rotator class. So the mouse y input maps to the first value, pitch, looking up and down and then mouse x will map to the second value, or yaw, looking left and right. In flybotplayerpawn.h, we'll define a new rotate function to handle this input action. We'll also add a rotate scale property so we can change the sensitivity. In flybotplayerpawn.cpp, 
We'll first set a default value for the rotate scale in the constructor. Then we'll bind the rotate action to our new rotate function in setup player input component. And then last, we'll define our new rotate function. In here, we'll first change our input action value to an F rotator. Next, we'll scale our input by the time that's passed since the last tick by using get delta seconds. This is important to do so our mouse sensitivity feels the same even as our frame rate changes. We'll also multiply this by the rotate scale that we defined. We'll then add the pawn's current rotation to the input rotation, getting the new rotation to use for the pawn. To make this feel like a more traditional control, we're going to clamp our pitch so we can't look further than straight up or straight down. We'll also set the roll to zero to make sure the horizon doesn't change. And then last, we'll set this as the new pawn rotation. If we build it, run it, and hit play, we can now look around in any direction. Combined with the move actions, it's starting to feel like the input you'd expect in a 3D game. Since this is a flying game, it would be nice to have a mode where we can move and rotate in any direction we want, as much as we want. Let's do this by adding a free fly mode that we can turn on and off. First, open up flybotplayercontroller.h and add a new input action called free fly action. In flybotplayercontroller.cpp, we'll create the object for this action and then map it to the F key. While we're in here, let's also bind Q and E to our rotate action to control the roll. We pass in a swizzle option to swap z and x, so it's written into the third value of our input value. In flybotplayerpawn.h, let's add a new method to toggle our free fly mode, and also add a new boolean value to keep track of which state we're in. In flybotplayerpawn.cpp, we'll set a default value of false, and then bind our new input action to our new method. Notice that we're using started for our trigger event value, rather than triggered like with our other actions. This allows the action to only be run once when a key is pressed, rather than continuously as long as you're holding the key down. Next, we define our toggle free fly function which simply reverses the state variable. And last, we'll update our rotate function to calculate our actor rotations differently if our free fly mode is enabled. Rather than do the math ourselves, we're going to call a function called add actor local rotation. This converts the rotators to quaternions before doing the calculation, which gets around a problem called gimbal lock. Doing it this way gives a much more natural and intuitive feel to the controls. If you want to see what this feels like without using quaternions, just disable the pitch and roll adjustments we're using with the other mode. The inputs are going to feel pretty weird. If we build it, run it, press play, and then press F, you'll see we can rotate in any direction we want without any limits. We can also press Q and E to apply a roll rotation. If you press F again, you'll see we'll snap back into the old input mode. I like having both modes because while testing the free fly mode, I started getting a little motion sickness. When I swap back to the other mode though, I felt fine. While the inputs are feeling pretty good, there's still a few things to take care of. For example, it'd be nice if the player's static meshes moved around a little bit to give a sense of flying. They could also react slightly while pressing input keys, such as tilting left or right or moving the head. Also, the camera placement isn't very good. The pond could be moved down a bit so we can see more in front of us. Another issue is that the camera and spring arm need some adjustments because when you get too close to a wall, the camera gets placed into the middle of the mesh, which looks pretty weird. Also, none of the collision handling has been set up, so you can fly right through the walls. In the next video, I'm going to focus on setting up the collisions for both our new pawn as well as the existing map meshes. This will prevent us from flying through walls and keep our players inside the map we've built. If you have any questions, be sure to ask in the comments down below. Thanks for watching.